Okay, so this evening's talk, The Downfall of Dancing, or rather John Playford's English Dancing Master 1651, What Do the Titles Mean and Why English, is being presented by Anne Hinchliffe. And just to give a little bit of information about her, if you haven't met her before, she's passionate about British history and folk music and has been so since young, um, particularly dance. Um, Earlier, inspired by a weekend course to train young teachers, she became a member of the Historical Dance Society, which was 30 years ago, and has since enjoyed not only the scholarship, but also the fun and camaraderie of historical dancing. And Anne is interested in forensically examining the British traditions of dance and music, and researching the origins of the English ma dancing master touches on many fundamental expressions of English and British dancing. So welcome Anne and we look forward to your talk right now. Thank you. Thank you Anne, the other Anne. Yes. Um, happy Ash Wednesday everybody and I hope you had some nice pancakes yesterday, uh, Shrove Tuesday, and thanks to the splendid team who've put the technicalities of the video together. Now, I'm going to begin with three slides showing my main primary and secondary sources so that if you're looking at this on the recording later, you can stop the video and take notes. So uh, here are some sources. It's not going through. Ah, there we go. OK. While you're looking at that, I'll add a um, sort of apology or a thanks to anybody who is at all miffed by the fact that I shall talk about England and English all the way through. Um, I know there's people from Britain, there's people from the States and so on, but you'll understand during the period I'm talking about, England was mostly England and it's simpler that way. Next slide. These are three of the books that I used, but not the only ones. Uh, I've simplified quite a lot of the numbers that I'll use, whether they're dates or how many dances, um, so as not to overrun. Otherwise, I'll be explaining forever why there are two different totals to the dances or two different dates. But do let me know if you spot a mistake, please. And the third slide. You'll be very glad to know that all of the items on this third slide are freely available online. There's the Historical Dance Society moniker at the top and I've used a lot of articles from the journal and conference proceedings which are written there. And further down there's references to Tamsin Lewis Passamezzo and lots of excellent facsimile stuff online and the wonderful ABC notation which will play lots of tunes for you. HDS also has lots of videos um, of the dances that I'll be talking about in this talk. So if you want to see what a, a pavern or a measure or a galliard or something looks like, go to the Historical Dance website and click through onto the, the short videos there. They're only two, three minutes long. Very useful. Right, let's get going. Now, in this talk, I'm going to sketch in John Playford's geographical background and the cultural background of music, dance and song. I will touch on the origins of the dance titles in The English Dancing Master of 1651. I'm going to call it the EDM. I shall explore where the dances came from, both the elements of the dances and the set choreographies. You might say the ingredients and the recipe. Finally, I'll speculate on how English the dances were, still are, and why this might have been really important to, to Playford. I'm not expecting to say a lot that's new to many of you. What I'm trying to do is to make connections. So 
First slide, City of London. Playford's background as a young adult. London today, as we all know, stretches for miles, but it began as a walled town, less than a mile wide, built by the invading Romans on the banks of the River Thames. And the walls that they built are outlined in blue here. The blue balloons show where the, the gates of the walls were. And this area inside the walls is still known as the City of London. The bridges across the river in this uh, diagram, of course, didn't exist in Playford's time. There was only London Bridge, that was all. And let's go to the next slide. So London was tiny compared to what it is now. You can see the walls of the City of London. They start from the Tower of London on the right in the west and they go all round the city nearly and then go back down to the river. Except that the city has started to spill out into the fields, the farmlands and the countryside around London, but not very far. And it's only 10 minutes walk, well, maybe 15, from the river up out into the open countryside. Uh, this map is dated 1550. In fact, it's a later one than that, because in the middle you can see St Paul's Cathedral and there's no spire on it. The spire burnt down in, I think, 1561. So this map was obviously um, adjusted or adapted later than that. So when John Playford started his apprenticeship in 1640, at the age of 17, the city was still effectively this size, maybe a few more houses in the northwest corner, but not many. So where was young John Playford living and working while he was an apprentice. Next slide, I hope, shows the area. This is a more modern map and it shows roughly where the inns of court are. St Paul's Cathedral is on the right, just off the map. And going across the centre of the map, is Fleet Street, which becomes the Strand, the road called the Strand. Here is Chancery Lane going up to the northwest, and Playford's master, John Benson, had a shop, a print shop, a bookshop, bookseller's shop, um, all the same sort of business, one on Fleet Street and one on Chancery Lane, right next to the Inns of Court inside the orange um, boundary. So any law work that needed to be done would be right on the doorstep. Very good commercial um, sense. You can see Lincoln's Inn Fields, they, they show up in the maps later. The other sort of work that he'd be uh, publishers would do is a lot of church work and again having St Paul's and the other churches nearby was very handy since the days of the Reformation, Henry VIII, about a century earlier, there'd been loads and loads of stuff to be printed from the church and the law. So there were hundred, well, dozens of booksellers and printers in, in this whole area and plenty of work for them to do. As well as the church and the law, uh, booksellers, printers, publishers used to print lots of broadside or broad sheets for the general public. It might be an ordinary member of the public who could read and had a halfpenny to spend on a broad sheet, maybe a shilling to spend on a book. But the broadsides or the broad sheets were published in thousands, possibly more. And here is the broad sheet that I used for the title page. Oops. There it is. This broadsheet or broadside is from 1670. I chose it because it has a mishmash of tunes and songs and words in it. And it illustrates the backdrop to, to John Playford's uh, association with music and dance and song. Now it's a risque ballad uh, about six male musicians fighting over a woman. 
and in the blurb at the top it says playing at up tails all that means having sex or making love it's also the name of a tune in the dancing master books uh, sorry in the english dancing master of 1651 but that's not the tune for the song the song is to be sung to the tune of robin goodfellow so there's there's a right mix of words and dancing and songs okay excuse me We have some in archives something like 10,000 of these broad sheets, broadsides that have survived for what three, four hundred years. Now, if we've got 10,000 that have survived, flimsy as they were, just imagine how many must have been printed for that number to survive. So it probably went into the millions for people to sing and play and dance from. Right, let's go back to um, where John Playford was living. Here is another map of London, um, technically 1572, but again, pretty much the way Playford would have known it. In the middle, I hope you can see, is St Paul's church as it was then and it's got the steeple so this map was published or uh, drawn before the big fire that burnt the steeple down again you can see all the walls going round the city except where they've been broken down to the north of St Paul's Cathedral is the open space called Smithfield which is still there Smithfield Market and there were fairs there nearly every day not Sunday of course we wouldn't have a fair on Sunday tut tut and the big fair was called Bartholomew Fair. It was in uh, on around St Bartholomew's Day in the height of summer. And Ben Johnson, who wrote Masks, wrote a play about Bartholomew Fair, which has lots of songs and, and bits of dancing in it. And that's where a lot of the apprentices like Playford would go where if they happened to have some time spare. And also a lot of the law students from the Inns of Court, which are just to the west of the cathedral, they might also go up to Smithfield or they might go down to the River Thames and take a boat across the river to the South Bank. Let's have a look at a picture of the South Bank. There's St Paul's Cathedral, that's after the steeple burnt down. On the South Bank you can see playhouses and theatres with flags on. There would be bear baiting, there would be cock fighting, there were plenty of brothels around as well. And one of those theatres is Shakespeare's Globe. So there was no shortage of plays, music, song and dance. Um, looking back at the north side of the river, you might spot a church with a round tower. And that is uh, the Temple Church. That's where Playford in 1648 later set up shop. But at the moment he is still an apprentice. The Inns of Court students, uh, as well as their legal curriculum, also had to learn fencing, sword fencing and dancing. And studying those arts would take them out of the inns to the dancing masters who were in various parts of London and you can see what a big bustling city it was even though at the back of the city you can see the green fields and the hills. So that that's where Playford would, would have lived for the six or seven years of the, apprent of the apprenticeship. Now while the apprentices were out in the fields they might do dancing, they might practice their archery and other martial arts. King James had the sixth and first had been very keen on this and other traditions. He and his son King Charles the first who was on the throne at the time Playford was an apprentice. They issued the two kings issued one after the other a book of sports which gave explicit permission to you once you had been to church 
to enjoy archery, dancing or any other such harmless recreation, together with May Games, Whitsun Ales, uh, an ale is a feast, Morris dances and setting up maypoles. Women can carry rushes to the church for the decorating of it, according to old custom. So the two kings, James and Charles I, are affirming the old English customs which people have enjoyed for centuries, including dance, maypole and Morris dancing. OK. On the next slide, we have an example of a different sort of dancing that Playford would have known, probably not taken part in. I'm sorry, jump a slide, there we go. And that is a mask. QUE. This one may well have been a wedding mask and some of you will recognise it uh, from the, the picture at the top which shows the whole painting. It's uh, the Henry Unton portrait. Henry Unton is in the middle and all around the outside are scenes from his life including this very fine mask scene. Henry and his family and friends are having a banquet. Sorry that's not correct. They're having a feast of some sort. It might be a banquet, which really means little desserts and sweet cakes, or it might be a complete meal. On the left, he is shown playing music with friends sitting round a table, and in the centre is a mask. Uh, couples and uh, dancers entering in couples, and they're going to perform a short, very simple play with music and songs and spoken word. So John Playford had a world, lived in a world of music, dance and song. There were playhouses, they were full of dancing. Uh, in around 400 plays from roughly 1590 to 1642, 350 of them have stage directions for dancing of some sort. And the text of many plays has have dances in. They talk about country dance, galliard, carantos, they make puns on words like slip or measure. So evidently the audience was assumed to know all these dance terms, whether the, the French posh dances like galliards and carantos or whether the ordinary English country dances. There were rope dancers everywhere, often associated with puppet shows. In the street, ballad singers would be singing to entice customers to buy their broadsheets. Playford and his fellow apprentices, perhaps friends from the Inns of Court, would probably sing and play as they walked along. We don't know how many people played instruments at the time, but Samuel Pepys uh, observed that one in three households had a keyboard of virginals. Um, when the apprentices got to the fields, they might well dance. There are loads, there are hundreds of local court records from the 1600s of people being fined for riotous dancing. And even if young Playford had never actually seen a mask, he'd have heard about them from friends, perhaps apprenticed as a cook or a servant in a great house, or from law students whose families were rich enough to have a mask. So let's go and see some of the dances that Playford collected. John Playford had been working on this project, as he says in the preface to the English Dancing Master, for long enough to have an excellent copy of the dances by him and he had the assistance of a knowing friend. So he's obviously thought a lot about this. He's gathered, he's decided to print and publish over a hundred dances, many different kinds. As you can see here from the diagrams, there's rounds, there's squares, there's long ways and so on. Little squares, big squares. And he's worked out how to fit the text and the music together. And this is the first time ever in England that anybody has done this. There are lots of notes of dancing, the equivalent of backs of envelopes. This is the first ever printed book of English country dances. So where did these dances come from? That's a bit difficult. There are 
quite a lot of printed sources or handwritten sources, but printed uh, broadsides and books for songs and tunes because you can write songs and tunes down. And you can trace them, for example, with the books of Thomas Ravenscroft. Let's have a look at some of those. Uh, in the middle, there's two of Ravenscroft's books. Um, they include songs that you will know, for example, Three Blind Mice, Three Blind Mice, and so on. Round the outside are some ballads, and some of them have music, uh, sheet music, uh, staff notation on them. If not, the bookseller would, would, the ballad seller would sing it in the street. But dancing, virtually nobody had written down in a systematic way. There is a few notes here and there, like for the measures, but for the country dances, no. There's all these references in plays, stage direction, they dance. It doesn't actually say what the dances were. And it's a bit complicated again. The, the ballad at the centre top is called The Great Booby. It says, to be sung to Selinger's Round. Now, there are two, two tunes called Selinger's Round. The tune most of us know is dun da 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 dun da 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 dun da 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 dun It's in my Lady Neville's book, 1591, uh, apparently composed by William Byrd. In Playford's version, which he doesn't print till 1657, it's got quite a different tune. There are ballads here noted to the tune of Cock Laurel, or Cook Laurel, which is in the EDM as an old man is a bed full of bones. So again, you'd have to try the tunes and try singing it, see if it works, if you want to decide which tune fits which dance. There's a ballad here of the Rump Parliament on the left, says to the tune Up Tales All. Now that's in Playford and it goes something like la 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 up tails all la la da 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 and it goes on and on like that it's boring and it doesn't fit the words so there must be another up tails all somewhere however on on and that's that's at least easy to sing on the right is another ballad if this is to the tune of Hey Ho My Honey, and I'm not going to attempt to sing that because although it fits the words, it's a very complex tune. It accidentals all over the place. That says something about the, the musical skill of people who would use these ballads. I take my hat off to them. So we have lots of sources of music, but nothing or virtually nothing about what country dances were. Lots of references. So we've got the 16th century play Misogynus, has scenes of country dancing. It names them catching of quails and the shaking of the sheets and they're in Playford. But we have no idea if it's the same dance or a different dance or what the tune was at all. The dance tunes are probably more prevalent than we realise. A uh, bloke called William Webb, writing in 1586, Discourse of English Poetry, says, There's no tune which may be sung or played on instruments which hath not some poetical ditties framed according to it, some to Rogero, some to Trenchmore, songs to galliards, to pathins, to jigs, to brawls, to all manner of tunes which every fiddler knows better than myself. So he's saying that dance tunes often came first. And then the words. Well, if we can't get sources for country dance tunes, what evidence can we get? Well, I'm going to look now at the different kinds of dances being done in London in the first half of the 17th century. We've got court dances, either choreographed for a new mask or couple dances such as Carantos, Canaries, Galliards, from the repertoire which would be learnt by young nobles and royals for displaying at court events, for consolidating their social status, for indicating their international savoir-faire. That's court dances. We also have the old measures or the measures. That's around eight processional dances which were used in the various inns of court at the beginning of the special events called revels. 
and they carried on all through the Civil War and into the Restoration afterwards. And whether Playford might or might not have seen a revel and measures, he would have known about them from his friends. There's dance within drama. We've just touched on stage plays and I'm not going to talk about that because I haven't got enough evidence. And finally, there were country dances and Morris dances. And there's lots of references to that uh, Morris dance. Here is what we would call Morris dancers. Next slide. Whoops. In a 16th century glass window from Staffordshire in the West Midlands. And you can get quite a lot of information from that window, of course. What it doesn't say and what the, the Morris dance and country dance references don't say is how to do the dances. There's clues. Morris dances are usually done in costume. There are church records for the payment of them, usually paying for bells. There are references, for example, in Will Kemp's Nine Days Wonder, references to leaps and jumps and to audiences watching. So Morris dancing is a costumed performance, very lively and for a special occasion. You can do it impromptu. The, the women and men who joined Will Kemp on his nine days dancing from London to Norwich did it impromptu, but that's unusual. Country dancing is definitely impromptu or frequently impromptu. You don't need a costume for it. It can be done, according to the references, in a parlour, in a yard, round a maypole, and nearly always for fun, for exercise. Some of the courtiers did actually do country dances with some foreign visitors. Uh, the Duke of Buckingham invited uh, an ambassador to his house after some formal dancing and they had country dancing until I think about four in the morning just for fun. Until 18, 1640 though there's no evidence of what dance moves were done but there is evidence that they were danced by English people from all walks of life. Some of these dances have a lot of common elements. The court dances, the measures and the country dances. I'm not using a choreographic analysis, a more, but a more general analysis. The basic unit is a couple and the basic dance moves are geometric. There's a pattern of movement across the floor space. There's a symmetry, taking turns of dancers or taking turns of, of which side you're using, rights and lefts. The dance movements and the music are very closely related, including repeat patterns. Now, this may appear to state the obvious. Of course, social dancing is for couples and music and dance goes together. But I want to broaden the picture to consider types of dance in other societies which might help us look fresh at English country dance. In China, and it's uh, Chinese New Year at the moment, hello, classical dance in China and Asian countries developed over thousands of years as primarily storytelling. Simple folk tales, rivers, animals, or sophisticated operas. And gestures are used expressively so they're not mathematical patterns. You don't have to repeat something with a foot, right foot and then left foot. English dances of the era have virtually no narrative or expressive element. OK, some Morris dances are associated with folk dramas such as Maid Marian, who appears in that picture somewhere. I've lost her. Um, bottom centre there she is but generally English country dances and English measures and court dances they don't have a story and they don't have particular feelings in them. In Micronesia and Melanesia a lot of dances are based on the daily activities of that society might be fishing, hunting, fighting and they're performed not in couples but in groups sometimes defined by sex or age and similarly some Eastern European dances, for example, at Albanian weddings, uh, you get the hora, the long line dance, but it will be done by all the women or all the men or all the children or the young people, not mixed sex or couples necessarily. The music for a lot of those 
group dances has a regular rhythmic pulse but it doesn't have a tune that repeats necessarily. You do get Western European dances that have little tiny actions in or little tiny narratives but they're very stylized. Uh, here's a couple. On the left we've got Brault de la Vendière from Arbo in 1588. On the right we've got the Playford dance Sweet Kate which has got a sort of wool winding gesture with your hand but that's as far as it goes. Excuse me. The old measures are also based in couples. Uh, for some of them, the manuscripts that we've got for them uh, date from the mid 1500s through to the mid 1600s. And some of them are very brief, but luckily some of the dances are similar to dances in Arbo. So we can use Arbo's explanation to amplify the old measures. But they are danced in couples, one behind the other and in order of precedence. There's brawls. Um, uh, an Arbo brawl is, is shown here, but it seems to have been certainly known in England. They're also in couples, but they're in a ring or a line side by side. And Arbo says a high status couple may go to the head of the line and the other dancers will make way. So again, we've got couple dances with a, a sense of precedence. Display dances at court the Canaries, Galliards, the famous La Volta, they're for only one couple at a time. So you don't get the precedence or the hierarchy, but you get a very strong, almost magnetic attraction between the couples. All the movements are related to, to what your partner is doing or not doing. Now, when John Playford, having finished his apprenticeship and set up his shop, published the EDM in 1651, he explains that the country dances are formed of couples. Each dance has a little diagram. There's some printing errors in, but uh, that, that's not a hanging offence. And there's a table at the front of the book that explains the circle, the sun symbol is supposed to be for the man and the crescent, the moon symbol is for the woman. But he doesn't say anything about precedence and hierarchy. Nevertheless, it, there's got to be some precedence in the dances. Playford takes it for granted that everyone reading his wonderful new book will know which way is up and down in the set, where above and below are, who the first couple are. And that's absolutely crucial to know how to do the dances, but he doesn't spell that out. So evidently, that must have been part of English country dances and everybody could be assumed to know it. He explains single and double steps briefly and half explains set and turn single, but Playford also assumes that everyone will know what the dance movements are. Arms, sides, cast, hands around, hands across, the hay, whether it's the single hay, the double hay, he just assumes that everybody knows it. Therefore, those movements must be part of regular English country dances. So he didn't invent these country dances. Oh, there are a few where there's extra instructions. Uh, I'll come back to those later. Who did invent these dances? What were the origins of the English country dance? This is getting more conjectural. Many of the moves would be known from the measures, the old measures. You've got stepping forwards and back as a couple or individually. You've got turning by one hand or both hands, changing places. And you've got a single to the left, a single to the right and turn single. So that's a set and turn single in the measures. In the brawls, you've got weaving movements. All these sequences are, in my opinion, simple enough to have occurred spontaneously at some point as dancers formed couples in lines or columns 
or holding hands in a ring, and then these movements would develop naturally at some point they were written down. And then they could develop further. You might get a change with partner move combined with a forward and back step and suddenly you've got siding or possibly what we call a back to back, a dos a dos movement. The weaving moves could very easily become a figure of eight or a hay in its various forms. There is a brawl de la, la hay in Arbo, which he explains in huge detail. Dancer A changes with dancer B, then dancer C, etc. So it's obviously quite a new idea. By Playford's time, there were lots of different sorts of hays. This idea of development, I believe, is supported by a recent rediscovery of three 16th century dances that are sort of measures, but they have a slightly more complex sequence of movements and slightly longer tunes. They're called La Bonetta, La Chemise and La Duncella, all sorts of spellings. Here, if I can manage it, is the music for one of them. I think I have to add a new share. Bear with me. I can't make it work, so I will play the music at the end. Apologies about that. And I'm going to resume share. I hope this is still working. find out in a minute when we try to go on to the next slide. Now, I recently came across a small piece of evidence for the origins of 17th century dancing, and that is a reference to dances being written. It's from James Shirley's mask, The Triumph of Beauty, published in, or performed, I think, in 1646. And the villagers in it say, we half a dozen have penned a dance to revile your spirit. They mean revive your spirits. Simple as I appear, my head had a hand in it. Bagpipes play, and later they say, We come to frisk a bit in a ridiculous round to show thee sport in a well-written dance. So, during these early 1600s, James Shirley's dialogue implies that ordinary people, not dancing masters, might compose a dance. And now we come to a set of evidence that sheds really bright light on where Playford's dances came from. Let's check in the time, 20 to 7. The dance sources are listed in the bibliography that was on the first slide, and I hope I've got a sample here. Good, it's worked. One of the dance manuscripts is known as the Lovelace Manuscript, also known as the Patrick Manuscript. It's got over 30 titles, some of which, many of which, are cognate with Playford. This example is an old man with a bed full of bones, or a, an old man is a bag full of bones, sometimes it, it's written as. And there it is in Playford. And you can see, although there are differences in the Lovelace manuscript, there's more detail. Nevertheless, it's the same dance. I'll give you a second, a few seconds. Um, Alan, I don't think my slide hasn't changed. I'm still seeing Brawl de la Vendière. Right. Thank you for saying that. Apologies to the audience. In that case, I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to stop the share and we might just need to go through the beginning again. Let's see what's going to happen. It's nice to see faces. OK. Right, share screen. PowerPoint slideshow. Share. Right. Anne, have we got Lovelace yet? 
Yes. Oh. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. You were asleep that one. <laughs> that was a tease. Sorry. I think I know you well enough to tease. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. All right. So there are six manuscripts handwritten that cover a lot of the 1600s. Between them, they have over 80 dances. The numbers vary because some of them have got titles without instructions underneath. So do you count those or not? There are over 80 dances anyway. And 54 of them are dances that are in Playford's Dancing Master, either the original 1651 or one of the later dances. And I'm calling these cognate dances. They're not identical. And that is crucial because what it's showing us is that they're not just copies of what Playford might have made up. They are dances that existed on their own. They had their own style, a little bit of variation. In fact, quite a lot of variation. English dancers, of course, as Laurent pointed out in the later 1600s, are notorious for varying things. They'll do whatever steps they fancy in dances, says Laurent. Tut tut, says Laurent, I have uh, tidied things up a bit. But these English country dances in these six different manuscripts show a lot of small variation. Playford has done some tidying up. So nearly all the Playford dances uh, up and yes, for the 1600s have got the sequence that we nearly all know, lead up a double and back sides and, and arming, often called USA, up a double siding and arming. These movements come in the other country dances, but not as Eric Morkham would have said, not necessarily in the same order. And the first of these manuscripts was written 20 years or more before the Dancing Master came along. I did try to put all these 80 odd dances on a table to show you on the screen, but they came out so small that I couldn't get it on a, a slide. If anybody wants my tabulation of these dances, I can send it to you. They are all English dances. There's no French style dances at all. There's no French titles. Even in the manuscripts of these country dances that are after the restoration. I'll just read out the dates for you. There's the Stevens Manuscript 1640. There's the Lovelace Manuscript, which we're looking at, 1649. There's the Ward Manuscript of around 1660. There's the Boys Manuscript of 1667. There's the Lansdowne Manuscript of 1670 and the Sloan Manuscript of 1679. And none of them has any, as far as I can see, any French references to it. The, yes, the later manuscripts are not copies of dances from earlier Playford. They have their own style. The styles are consistently different. And also the later manuscripts, uh, for example, Boys and Lansdowne, they publish, they, sorry, write dances down that Playford hadn't published yet. In other words, they couldn't have been copied from Playford, if I've got that right. Now, again, there is a huge variety of styles in these country dances. Some of them are so simple that they could have evolved naturally. We've got dances like Goddesses or An Old Man is a Bed Full of Bones. You've got here, gallop down the middle, back again, set twice, lead your woman up, gallop down the middle, back again and do turn her under if you fancy it and then do it all again. Other dances are complex. We've got uh, in some of the manuscripts, we've got Newcastle. We've got Cuckolds all a row, which is obviously Cuckolds all a row. They've been worked out by somebody who had leisure to sit down and do back of envelope stuff. Even if they weren't a dancing master, you can't just write down something like Newcastle without quite a lot of, of uh, careful preparation. All these country dances have the same structure that I've already identified. They're all based on couples. They've all got, when it's a long way set, an upper and a lower part. They talk about up and down. And they've all got movements that are broadly similar, arming, turning and so on. 
with a few distinctive extras here and there, like a clapping movement or forming a line of four abreast. OK, so the English country dances have appealed to enough 17th century people for us to have six surviving manuscripts. That must be, I guess, the tip of the iceberg. And dozens more dances existed that we just don't know about. Playford recognised the importance of the country dance and in the last five minutes or so, I hope to unpick some of the importance for him. John Playford recognised the importance or he wouldn't have collected them and arranged them so carefully. And OK, he'd spotted the commercial possibilities. Songs and tunes could be bought in books and broadsheets. Nobody had ever yet published any dancing, country dance material. I'm going to leave a bit there, but Playford had the commercial acumen to spot a gap in the market and he certainly had the ability to work hard and publish those things. If you look at the number of books, other music books that he published, there are something like 16 or 17 of them and they all went into at least four editions, if not 10 for some of them, uh, Apollo's Banquet and so on. Um, so he knew what he was doing and he made it work. Let's just have a look at the temple church where, I don't say it's frozen again, where Playford's, there we go, Playford's shop was supposed to be. And it's right in the middle of one of the Inns of Court. And the Inns of Court dancers might well want some more complicated dances. So this is where Playford has included, as well as the country dances, Dances that I think, and I know other people agree with me, may have been composed by a dancing master. There's Gray's Inn Mask, there's Parsons Farewell, and there's little square dances that are very complicated. And there are three dances that actually have a special diagram with them. That's um, Gray's Inn Mask, um, Hyde Park and Fain I Wood. And they have a little diagram that says this is a square and the numbers go this way round. There are other dances like Newcastle, um, like all, If All the World Were Paper, which I would call a square, but for some reason they're just described as a round. So there's some transition going on there, but there's also evidence that a dancing master's hand has, has been helping Playford in this somewhere. That may have been the friend that he referred to in the preface. That's pure guesswork. Playford went on improving his book. You can almost hear his thoughts as you look through the editions. 1652. The first edition sold out good. Let's do a second edition. We'll reset the type. We'll tidy that index up a bit. Add a few more dances. Oh, um, those blooming Puritans are still around. I think maybe I'll get rid of Prince Rupert's dance. They might not like it. And uh, my, my best customer doesn't like Rufty Tufty. Let, let's get rid of that. And my mates are saying the book's too big. Let's print it in a smaller format. Fast forward to 1662. Hey, that second edition sold out. And so did the 1657 print run, Playford might have thought. And, says Playford, his majesty, Charles II, is back on the throne. Hallelujah. So there'll be more people wanting to dance. My friend Samuel Pepys said I might add some dance tunes. Let's see. Yes, I'll do that. Or maybe I'll print them as a separate book. So he tried all those things as the editions went on. So let's go in the last couple of minutes to Playford's Royalist Sympathy. Let's go back to his younger days. Change slide. <clears throat> Please ignore the fact that this slide is, is after the Great Fire of London. I've used it because it shows again where the old city walls are, but also how far the houses have spread on the outside and haven't spread. Um, this is a 1667 map. It's fairly similar to 1640, 1650. There are houses outside London, but there's still fields beyond those. In 
I haven't got a date there, but in 1640, I think, the apprentices of London would have seen civil war coming. King Charles's extravagance had really got up people's noses. At one point, he dissolved Parliament and refused to convene it for 11 years because they wouldn't vote him any taxes. And in 1642, war broke out. Meanwhile, fortifications had been put up all around London. There were 18 miles of ramparts, 23 forts, and there were 212 cannon mounted on the ramparts. And the apprentices would have seen all this coming. And as the wars started and lasted for six years, Playford, only 25 years old, 24, 25, would have seen and heard about bloody battles, injured people, deaths, and perhaps he'd have seen some of that with his own eyes. So when he published The English Dancing Master, this word English didn't just mean, as is sometimes said, cocking a snook at the French Dancing Masters. Yes, there was a 1640 play called The French Dancing Master, which was revived after the Restoration. Sam Pepys liked it. But actually, Playford had, had tangled with more serious matters. He had, a year before, he'd published a best-selling book of King Charles's trial. Playford could have ended up on the scaffold for that. He didn't. So I think that he published The English Dancing Master as part of wanting to get back to the England of dances and singing and music that he loved and that he knew other people loved. He wasn't alone in thinking along those lines. And we know that not just because the book was a runaway bestseller, but the king, when he came to the throne, restored the Maypole in the Strand, called for the old dance of England at at least one of his balls. And there is documentation such as in uh, John Shirley, not this is not James Shirley, this is John Shirley's 1687 miscellany called The Modish Method of Dancing in the examples of several set dances greatly in request. There's not a French tune in sight, but he lists half a dozen old English country dances. And the final dancing master, published not by Playford, but by his son, by his successor, sorry, 1728, there is a boast. This contains all the most valuable and commonly used dances these last 40 years. And 80% of the original English dancing masters dances are still in the popular dancing master, the best part of a hundred years later. Thank you very much for listening. A couple of slides to end with, a couple of pictures. There's some old English dancing. And here is some new English dancing. <laughs> and thank you again for listening. Well, thank you very much, Anne, for a really compelling uh, talk with wonderful illustrations. Um, so now, if people have questions, would they kindly put it in the chat? And I saw one a little further back. Um, where has it got to? Right. No, no, no. It, right. Well, it was about, um, it was, I noted it down. It was a question about the circle and round dances. Were there any in England? Line and circle dances. There's um, references around 1600 to uh, I haven't got the reference with me, to Selinger's, to, yes, Selinger's Round being danced around a maypole. I think that's the only specific one. Um, but since maypoles are so prevalent, they were so prevalent that there were lots of, there were half a dozen diatribes against them in the 1600s by William Prynne and various other people. If the maypoles were so prevalent and dancing happened, it seems very likely there were dancings round the maypole. It's not, by the way, the ribbon maypole that's in the centre of this picture now. That's a modern, fairly modern invention. But certainly there were lots of maypoles. Thanks. Thank you, Anne. Now, any more questions? We haven't uh, 
we've got some very complimentary remarks. Okay. Any more questions from anybody? Okay, well, um, Anne, you touched on the royalist connections with um, of, of Playford that has been suggested by various people. Even, I think, a, a suggestion that he, he got kidnapped or something by Cromwell. What can you tell us about that? There's an anecdote which I have never found a source for. If anybody listening knows the origin of this, I want to know it, please. It's not in the Dictionary of National Biography. The anecdote says he was kidnapped or surprised or, or taken at one point by Cromwell's soldiers who said to him something like, just stick to the music publishing, young man, and you'll be all right. <laughs> right. Now, I th thought that was an invention, but I've recently seen a reference in um, a, a, an American professor's work to some documents that shed light on Playford's royalist activities. And I haven't yet seen them published, those documents, and I haven't got hold of that lady yet, but I'm very keen to get hold of them and find out if there's any truth in that and that's, other background. Well, that that's very interesting and always particularly interesting to have new material coming up. Um, right, we've got a, a question about, do you think if Playford hadn't published these country dances, somebody else would? That's that's a, an interesting question, isn't it? Thank, I think that might have been Lynn. Um, Playford's uh, English Dancing Master in 1651, he says in the introduction to it, he, he's hurried it a bit, and it's like an apology, because there was another surreptitious copy that somebody had got nearly ready for press. So he'd obviously heard about that. I think somebody might well have done. Whether they would have done it as well as he did, I don't know. But if we've got six manuscripts of people writing country dances down, if we've got references in later printed documents, if we've got this copy that was a arrival to Playford, there was obviously some interest in these are our dances. We need to, to we want to record them. We want to share them in some way. Um, so I think yes, somebody might have done. But whether they would have done the brilliant job that Playford did in working out how to fit the music and the dances, how to lay them all out, I don't know. Right. Thank you. Now questions are coming in. Um, one is that a question that came up during the Playford conference weekend that we did was what percentage of dance tunes are associated with a known composer mm -hmm. in other words play for dance tunes and composers such as Purcell I don't know I'm sorry mm -hmm. um, to look at all the the is it 5,000 total dances lots of um, repetitions obviously in all the Playford books dances from 1651 to about 1728 would take a while somebody like Jeremy Barlow would probably know the answer I'm sorry I don't I think there have been some um, collections by folk dancers of Playford that have co collected the Purcell tunes too um, and another one, uh, where do the names of the dance tunes come from? Is it from the original song? Um, most of the 1651, yes. Um, so that the, the biggest number, it's, it's about 60-70% of the dance titles are connected with a ballad um, of some sort. Sometimes there's evidence for them. Sometimes you can guess um, an old man is a bed full of bones or a bag full of bones. I haven't found a source for, but it's a sort of line that would have come in a folk song somewhere, probably a scurrilous one. Do you know the, the folk song goes, an old man came courting me, hey ding dorum down, that sort of song. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I think there's about 60 or 70% in the 1651 publication, um, but we haven't got the exact evidence again. I hope that answers the question a bit. Thank you. Uh, another one is, have you done any research that you'll be willing to share into the meaning or origins of the names of many dances, such as My Lady Cullen or a Roses White, Roses Red? Um, I haven't done a, a huge amount. Other people have, have also done some. Um, I think maybe the time is right for, for me or somebody to, to, to put all the research like this together in, into a, a, a journal article. Um, there are royalist names in the English Dancing Master. We've got uh, My Lady Cullen is one, Newcastle may be another. It may be, but 
now we know that that dance called Newcastle existed separately, apart from Playford, it's not so certain whether you could say, oh, well, it was my Lord Newcastle who was um, um, a, a commander in the Royalist Army and that's why it was called that. So I think one has to take all the, the newer information into, into consideration first before we say, yes, the names come from this or that. <laughs> OK, I think we can take uh, maybe just one more. One is, do you think the 1651 book had an element of defiance? against the Puritans. Yes, yes. Um, I think it also has an, an element of joie de vivre. <laughs> um, it's got a huge range of dances. You've got the romps, which are virtually barn dances, bush dances, and you've got the complicated dances, Gray's Inn, Mask, and uh, Fain, I Would, Dulcer, John, Parsons, Farewell. And they are all very enjoyable dances. Now, I think that might have, this is pure supposition, might have appealed to Playford that a lot of the dancing, a lot of the playhouses have been closed down in 1642, but there are still things that we can do to enjoy ourselves. Mm -hmm. oh, that sounds like a very nice note to end on, Anne. I think we, we have to stop there. We're just past our, past our hour. So thank you very, very much indeed. And uh, thank you all for your contribution, those of you who've been listening and uh, contributing along the way. Um, just to remind you that the video of the lecture will be available on the Historical Dance Society's YouTube channel within the next few days. Um, and that we, of course, have another lecture next month. That is Wednesday, the 17th of March, uh, and we're going to a different era with medieval dance, rediscovery, reimagination, recreation by Charlotte Ewart. So do put that in your diary if you haven't already. Um, and Anne has encouraged me to say, because <laughs> I don't want to don't rain on her parade, um, that I'm doing a lecture myself on a similar um, field, really, for the Vaughan Williams Memorial Library of the English Folk Dance and Song Society next Wednesday. Um, it's all on their website if you want to uh, check it out. And I, I'm focusing on the young men of the Inns of Court um, and circulating around that, remembering that Playford called them their dancing, their you know light and airy activity. So um, Anne's given me plenty of things to think about for next week too. So thank, thank you. you all very much indeed for coming. Bye bye. Okay.